now you can maybe now you can hear me out there in Facebook land. I'm not sure if you did before, but um, yeah, blame it on getting old. But been like this my whole life. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? But I want us to talk about for a moment the fact that you all, all of us, are a, we are a masterpiece made for a purpose. God created us, and God created us for a reason. In fact, once again, we're talking about some independence, core value of here in America. We're taught to be self-sufficient. When you grow up, you're going to have to take care of yourself. I remember Dad saying, nobody else is going to look out for you. Me and Mom will be here for you, but how long is that going to work? You've got to get out there, and you've got to be self-sufficient. And we're told to, to fend for ourselves, right? Just, and that's a sign of strength. That's a sign of maturity. It's a preferred trait. We want to be independent. We don't want to rely on others, do we? No. No, that's why we work so hard. That's why we do what we do. But those who can't go it alone, alone and there's many people that can't go it alone. Sometimes they're viewed as weak or at least less capable because they can't function without somebody else. They can't make it work. And they trust many times on people who can help them do that. Now, guys, we value our independence, don't we, as Americans? Right now, our independence is being pretty well challenged, I think. We value this individualism above almost everything else. But let me tell you all something. We were not created to be independent. I'm going to share with you why I believe that, okay? But we weren't com- really created to live that way. In fact, it may, feel, it may feel like I'm trying to turn some things around, but the truth is we're created and we are called to live in community. We need one another. It's not a weakness to need somebody. It's not. Let me say it again, only this time let me make it more personal. You were created and called to live in community. You're not called to find your guys for us to find our woman, right, and then go off out in the woods somewhere and never need anybody else ever again. We're not designed that way. No, we're not. In fact, in the book of Genesis, God creates man, and then he says it's not good for man to be alone. And once again, not just because he might be lonely or maybe he needs a buddy. No, no. Because God wired us to do life together. I believe with all my heart this is why we have churches. We are a community. We are to do life together. God wired us to do life together. He created us and called us to do life in community. Now, some of us here, and maybe some of you listening as well, we're well, we're hooked into a church. We're, we're, we're trying to do this. But I think sometimes we still miss. And I, and I still think the problem, most of us don't want to do this, it seems. And I don't think it's because we are anti-community. We don't want to do it because I'm not sure we understand it. I'm not sure we really understand the importance of why God designed and created the church. Sure, the church is to reach out to the gospel and spread the gospel, but there's more to the church than that. And I think some people don't want to do it because we've been trained to do life independently. We don't want to do it because we don't know what we're missing. We don't know what we're missing. We don't want to live life in community because we don't know how to do life in community. And as a result, most of us are far too focused on being individuals. Even we involved in churches. How important is our church? How important is the other brothers and sisters in our church? How important? I think sometimes we, we, we get too focused on our individuality. But this individualism is robbing us of the joy and the strength and the hope that I believe people need. I know so many people that Okay, they've got their family. That's their little community, and I get that. That's important, obviously. Family is uh, one of the top priorities in life. But there's more to the community that God talks about than our immediate family. We should have, we call it a church family, don't we? There's some people that love to get into uh, clubs, right? Clubs. Why? It's, it's community. They don't even know why. Why did I get involved in in, in, in this club, whatever it may be, or why do I get involved? Uh, I believe even ball teams and things are communities. 
and, 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 and the things that, that we do. I believe there's some people that go to the same restaurants all the time, every week, and they, they, they meet some people, and now they talk together, they get to know the people that works there, and, and what have we done right there? What is it that calls and pulls us to do community, whether it's large or small? I said it earlier, we are wired that way. And I think the only way to break the habit of living alone and not getting involved in community is, the, is to experience the life that we're truly meant to live. And it's to learn how to live among community. How do you guys live among the church? Well, I go every Sunday, you know, faithful. Some of us even come Sundays and Wednesdays. Of course, back in the day, we did Sunday morning, Sunday night, every revival meeting that ever was. And I remember as a little kid, whenever they said, we're going on another week, it was like, <laughs> I'm talking as a kid, okay, another week. I mean, because if the church doors were open, the Stevens kids were in church. That's just the way it was, right? And, and, and as a kid, <laughs> but boy, I tell you what, I look back on my life and I realized that that church that we attended was our family. It was our community. And there's a lot of good things that came from that. And I think one of these lessons, I think what I want to share with you today, that, and, and actually for the next few uh, Wednesdays, if I may, that we're going to explore what it looks like to live life in community, not just as a group of different individuals. How many groups of those we see? I think some of the clubs are just a group of individuals, right? We're going to learn what it looks like to live as one, as the body of Christ. As one, as one. And this is far more important, I think, than I think it's really more important than a lot of us realize. Not just because doing life alone leaves us lacking, but because we're each wonderfully and uniquely created to be part of a community. And through that community, we ought to transform the world. Isn't that what the church is all about? Right now, the world needs transformed, it needs some changes. But it means that we need and we must do life together. We must learn to do life with others, even when life with others is difficult. If we're going to be family, let me ask you this. You and your family ever have conflict? Ever? Well, of course we do, right? As soon as you get two individuals, I don't care if they're family or not, there's going to be some conflict. So then you get a whole group together. It's tough sometimes. We learn to do life, I think, though, as a united community. There's nothing can stop the united community. So if we're going to learn to live in community, do life in community, transform the world as a community, we need to understand a couple things about ourselves. And that's what I want to explore a little bit today. I want to read with to you out of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. And, and here's what it says. Now, I'm going to wait a minute. Some of you are looking it up. Maybe some of you at home are looking it up. But I want you to read this with me. I'm reading it out of the uh, NIV. But here's what it says in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians. And for you Bible scholars, that is in the New Testament. Okay, so. I want to make sure you guys hook me up here. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. And here's what it says. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now listen to this. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Wow. Have you ever discovered one of the reasons you struggle to connect with others? Okay, I need you to stop reading now. This is my biggest problem because I just keep reading. I know what I'm talking about because I do it. I try not to do it, but I do it. So here's what I want you to think about for a moment. <laughs> Have you ever discovered that one of the reasons you struggle to connect with others is not them but it's you that's causing the connection not to work. This takes some time, I think, and some really honest thinking. Multiple failed relationships. 
What's the common denominator? Multiple jobs ending badly. What's the common denominator? Can't find a place to connect. Never feel like you belong. What's the common denominator? And I'm not saying there aren't times when others have left us out or we've been rejected. We all have. I'm not saying we've never been the victim of others' hurtful actions. But if we're honest, most of the time when we don't do well in community, it's because of us. We can blame others all we want, but it boils down to us. And I think it's because we don't understand who or what we are, nor do we understand who or what others are. If we're going to learn to live in community, we must learn what we are and what this means for how we live our lives. So, here's the question. What am I? You need to ask yourself for a moment. What am I? What are you? And how does this impact my life? I want to give you a short answer, and here it is. You are a masterpiece. Guys, if we could just grasp the truth of that teaching of God's Word, that we are a masterpiece, and how does that impact our life? When you live like a masterpiece, it transforms the world around you, and that's the point. You are a masterpiece. Act like it. Act like it. That's the only thing I want you to get to this seat. If you don't get anything else, you are a masterpiece. Act like it. Ephesians 2.10 says this. I'm not going to give you, I'm just going to read through this because we don't have a lot of time. But Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do, right? The word handiwork or workmanship could also be translated masterpiece. We were created by God. We were created for God. We were created in the image of God. So maybe we should ask, how do I act like a masterpiece? How do I do that? You do that by living up to your purpose. What is your purpose? Folks, I want to tell you right now, Debbie and I's purpose is more than pastoring, more than raising three awesome sons, in dad's opinion, right? Awesome grandkids. We have been designed to do more than those things. There's more purpose to our life, and we need to live up to that purpose. If you're a, you're a masterpiece created on purpose, for a purpose. And you know what that means? That means that we have a job to do. Because you are God's masterpiece created for good works, which he prepared in advance for you, is what the Scripture says. Then you and I, we have a job to do. And one of the greatest ways I believe that you and I can honor God, one of the greatest ways that we can live up to our purpose is to do the job that we were created to do. So how do we get that figured out? In fact, if you're not doing the job you were created to do, then you aren't living up to your value, to your potential. A vintage car is a masterpiece. You don't use a vintage car to take your little league ball players to the ball game. That's what minivans are for, right? A vintage guitar is a masterpiece. You don't let your seven-year-old bang on your show and or take it even the show and tell at school. No, it's a vintage. It's I have one of those. It's called a Gibson Hummerbird. And it's made back in the late 50s or early 60s. And it's worth quite a bit of money. And the boys are right now trying to figure out which one gets that when we're gone, right? But the but the thing is. I never let my little boys bang on that guitar. They always had something to, to hit on. But if you had the original Mona Lisa, you wouldn't use it to cover a hole in the restroom or, or, or paper the bottom of a birdcage. No, why wouldn't you do that? It's a masterpiece, right? And if it's a masterpiece, you use it according to its value. 
right? We value it. And since you are a masterpiece, you need to live up to your purpose. You need to be used for what you were created to be used for. But here's what I think some of us make a mistake. We learn a gift. There's something that we do. Could be teaching. Could be playing instruments. Could be singing. It could be any number of things. And we, and we camp around that one thing that we do, which is a good thing. But I think sometimes when we camp around it long enough, we think that's it. I found my, my, my calling, and it could be, it would be part of your calling. But what I'm trying to say is, don't cut yourself short and thinking that's the only gift God's going to give you. That's the only part of your life that is a masterpiece, if you will. You need to be used for what you're created for. Obviously, if you can sing, sing. But don't think singing is the only thing you have to do. That's why the New Testament spends so much time talking about the things that Jesus' followers shouldn't do. It's there. God doesn't just want a, 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 just a list of, of what? A arbitrary uh, list of words and things. He recognizes that you and I are masterpieces. He made us. He doesn't want us to be devalued. He does not want that. And we got to be concerned about that. So what's your job? What were you created for? Your job. Is it to represent Jesus? You know what that means? It means how you treat others. How you have conversations. How you manage your time. Are these all not gifts from God? If I would have known that time went as fast as it did, it seems to me that I would have made better plans. <laughs> I'd have tried to get more things done. But all of a sudden, you wake up and you're like, this is my 70th birthday? Okay, mine's going to be 72. But that's not the point. Okay, The point is you wake up one day and where'd he go? Where'd he go? And what happens is we, we sometimes... Don't value things in our life. If you're going to be a masterpiece, if you're going to live up to your purpose, you need to ask yourself this question. How am I representing Jesus? Now, you know as a pastor, we're going to talk about the community of Christ, right? We're going to talk about the masterpiece that Christ made, right, that you were designed and created to be. But how am I representing Jesus? And here's something I want you to really realize. Never, ever, ever think that what you're doing doesn't matter. It does matter. When you represent Jesus wherever you are, you're living a life of infinite value and purpose. You're doing your job even if the situation you find yourself in seems incredibly boring and mundane. Your job is to reflect Jesus back to our world. So maybe we ought to ask this question. What are we reflecting? What do people see of us? Cheryl and I, I believe, have an awesome opportunity among a, if any of them are listed, I'm sorry, but among a bunch of heathens, right? These guys, they're fun. They're characters, man. They're characters. And, and Cheryl and I, for whatever purpose and reason, have been placed in the midst of these guys. And I'm loving it. And, and, and Cheryl is too, okay? By the way, Cheryl got two really good hits today, man. I mean, he was hitting so, two doubles. And I'm telling you right now, he's not as fast as he used to be. So he hit it far enough to still get two doubles. Good way to go, Cheryl. Yeah. So, but once again, the reflection that we give when we're around people, when we're doing our jobs, whatever it may be, no matter, once again, as I said, no matter how mundane, it doesn't matter what are you reflecting. And I think the second way you act like a masterpiece is recognize the value of others. Just like you were created in God's image and are, therefore, a masterpiece, everyone you interact with, were they not also made in the image of God? That doesn't mean they're serving the Lord, but God's creation was in His image. So that's all of us. 
If everyone else is also a masterpiece, then you've got to ask yourself this. How am I treating others? Now, I know, I know all of you in this room very well. You're good people. You treat people right. I've watched you. I've seen you. And you know what? That's the way it should be. But what, what, we want, what I want to continue to do is to continue to do the right thing and recognize that value. Now, let me tell you, this is how we are. You don't have to admit it if you don't want to. But we judge a lot. Somebody walking around, for example, the judgment we just made on some of these guys we don't even know, right? These boys, pressed, I mean, praise the Lord, they're in church, right? And, and, and they were walking around and we didn't know them. And the one boy that this was his church, he was showing his friends the church, and um, he wasn't recognized. Oh, I should have been recognized. You know, and, and he took it real personal. But after talking to him, man, I said, think about it, buddy. Nobody here knew you. How did they know you? And I said, you know how many wackos in this world? I'm glad somebody came up and said something to you to make sure everything was okay, you know? But once again, the first thought is, especially in this day and age, is this safe? You know, are these, are, what's going on? You know, what's all of a sudden these young guys are showing? But, but the thing is, we're, we're guilty, not of this. This was... We did the right thing here, I think. We, we needed to stop and say, hey, guys, what, can we help you with something, right? No, that was the right thing to do. But our first, let's, let's just go back to people we meet. Somebody brings somebody in, and the first thing we do, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that as we sit in the congregation, we got a guest speaker. We're all wondering if this guy's going to be a good speaker. We're wondering if, um, I don't want to say I'm going to wonder if I'm going to like him or not, but I've had some come to me later and say, Pastor, um, boy, that one speaker was awesome. Um, but the next time you're gone, um, if maybe you could, you might want to get somebody else. <laughs> that guy put us to sleep or that guy went an hour or whatever it was, right? And nobody comes in anger and animosity. And I don't know that's so much judging. But the thing is, we're so quick to judge. We're so quick to, and I, what was it I asked Sunday? How many of you ever made a quick decision, and found out you were wrong. You know, I've met people before, man, that guy, man, let me just tell you, to be honest, I said, you know, man, that guy's a jerk. You know, you should act like that. Turned out to be one of my best buddies. <laughs> After I met him, he, 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 he was okay. He was just, I, I look back now, was he was nervous. He didn't know anybody. He, you know, he acted like he thought people would want him to. You know what I'm talking about. It's not really them. They just put on this show because, and then they say things and do things. But see, even with people that come up and do things that are absolutely wrong, the Bible teaches us that that person is still made in the image of God and they're a masterpiece. You need to recognize the value in others. And if that's true, then understand that everyone else, everyone is made in the image of God and their masterpiece. Doing life in community, it only works when we realize we're made in God's image and we recognize that everyone else is too. And I think we've got to be careful that we don't just have our little circle of friends. And then others are on the outskirts. We need to be open, do we not, to all of God's creation. I think the New Testament is not only full of things we should avoid, right, to help us recognize our value, but it's also full of things that we should do for others because God wants us to recognize others' value. Value. That's why Paul wrote these words to one of Jesus' communities in the first century. In Philippians 2, 3, and 4, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. What was he thinking? Do nothing, you know, 
in humility value other people above you? Are we taught that in the United States? Are we taught that in this world? To, to think of people higher than ourselves? Oh, it ain't going to happen. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Jockeying what for position. Campaigning. Manipulating to get your way. Do nothing out of vain conceit. Selfish ambition. Vanity are the status quo for most of culture. But for those who follow Jesus, Paul says, no, that's not how a masterpiece treats another masterpiece. Instead, we got to learn how to value others above ourselves. This is what Jesus did. This is how Jesus lived. This is how Jesus impacted, what, humanity. And when we live nice, this, this is how we reflect back Jesus to our world. It's how we do it. In fact, Paul follows this up in Philippians 2, 5, and 7. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Didn't Jesus put others above himself? I mean, he reflected his father in everything that he did. And the way a masterpiece treats another masterpiece is by making yourself a humble servant like Christ. Now, I believe most Christians believe they're humble. And I believe to a point we are. But I'm not sure we are really as humble maybe as we think we are. Maybe we need to order to seek God and say, God, I want to be humble in all areas of my life. I want to be humble, God. I want to reflect you to, to the world, if you will. Let me say that phrase again. The way a masterpiece treats another masterpiece is by making yourself a humble servant like Christ. And you know the best way to do this? Go back to your purpose. Go back to the job you've been given by God. Seek that job out. How hard have we sought that? Young moms to your kids, how are you serving your kids? Husbands to your wives, how are you serving her? Wife to your husband, how are you serving him? On the job, how are you serving those that you're working with and the company that you represent or whatever it may be? In your neighborhood, how are you serving them? In the marketplace, how are you serving them? You know what my favorite thing in the marketplace? This one little short lady like this is trying to reach a box. And I go, excuse me, ma'am, is this what you wanted? And I mean, it's right here. I don't have to stretch or anything. And how many times, most of them say, if I can get it, uh, you know, you can't. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. No, you're not. Hey, I'm just going to hang it. Is this the one you wanted? Why do they go, yeah? Why is it that people won't, res- are they afraid? Well, maybe they need to be. I don't know. In this society today, somebody walks up to you to offer help or something. You don't know if it's for real or not. But the thing is, guys, we as born-again believers with the right spirit and the right heart and the right tone of voice, as we walk up to somebody that needs some assistance, that we can, that we can reflect Jesus in the marketplace. Online, guard your words on Facebook and things like that. Some of the things people say, I'm like, boy, are they thinking? You know, it is crazy. But I want you to think about it. Everyone you come in contact with was created by God, which makes them a masterpiece also. So, if we're going to be one, if we're going to get community right, we have to recognize that we are all masterpieces. We need to act like it. So what's the takeaway here tonight? What do, what do we do with this thought? I want to give you a three-step takeaway for us here today. Number one, pray that God will help you realize that you are a masterpiece. And ask Him to reveal it to you. There's times in my life when I'm thinking, 
God, I don't deserve all this grace you have given me. You know, I was up there praying a few minutes ago, and my name was up, well, there it is on the screen, right? And I'm like, God, I've been here for 14 years now, Lord. You have blessed me, and I feel honored that you have asked me to be the pastor. And I'm standing there looking at my name, and I'm thinking, I could have never dreamed this up. <laughs> this is what God directed Debbie and I to do. But I'm guaranteeing you, I told you I went back to one of my high school reunions and talking to some of the kids there, and one of the girls was asking, Keith, what are you doing now? I go, oh, I'm a minister. Of course, she gave it one of these, right? Keith Stevens is a minister? Wow. She said, you didn't exactly wreck holy terror on the school, but a minister? Keith, are you telling me the truth? I go, hey, God can do anything, okay? But, but and, and then the little lady, when I, when I came back to the church I was raised in, and I was going to pastor, that little lady got, gave a testimony. Out of all the young men that ever went through this church, I thought you'd be the last one God ever sent back. And I'm like, <laughs> somebody asked me there, did that offend you? I said, no, nah, it didn't offend me. I thought it was hilarious, you know. And I mean, I would have to agree with her. You know, I just never would have thought that growing up. But you see, when you're a masterpiece and you allow God to, that God's created, you realize that you start once again seeking out his will. What do we just say? Ask him to reveal to you and to help you to realize what a masterpiece you are. Ask him to show you, ask God to show you the value in his eyes. God, show me the value in your eyes. Ask Jesus to help you see yourself the way he sees you. Step number one. Step number two. Ask him to help you see others the way he sees them. Ask him to show you how you can serve those other masterpieces that you come in contact with. God, what can I do to be more and to reflect more of you off my life that others may see? And then the last step. Start serving. Don't wait for the perfect time. Don't wait until you feel like it. Serve these other masterpieces. Too many people stand back and say, God, I don't know what you want me to do. So you know what my thought is? Do what you do know he wants you to do. I want you to be honest. I want you to be faithfully. I want you, to, you know all the things, God, as we go down the line. God wants us to do a lot of these things. Well, do those until you find out exactly what he has in your life. And Debbie and I did that. When I got out of out of college, I didn't know for sure what God wanted me to do at that time. No, no, while I was in college seeking the, what God wanted me to do in my life, I didn't know what he wanted. I didn't know if he was going to call me to be a pastor. I didn't know if he was going to call me to be an evangelist, a missionary, or just a good board member, council member. I didn't know what he was going to call me to do. But I thought to myself, well, I ain't going to hang around and wait to find out what it is. I'm just going to get busy. So Debbie and I, even before we were married, we sang on the 700 Club. That would have been in 1971. Debbie and I, at the Easter time, and we sang the three rusty nails. And um, Pat Robertson, of course you guys know me, right? Here's, here's all of the kids from college there lined up, and he's talking, interviewing somebody. And all of a sudden, he, oh, he's interviewing the, the, the school president. He said, um, hey, let's get one of, your, one of your students up here, uh, and maybe we can talk to them a little bit. So nobody's moving, right? Everybody's just standing still. So all of a sudden I went, and the second I moved, he, I caught his eye. He goes, hey, Keith, come on up here. I'm like, why did I do that? Because I wanted to go up there and see, just to see how cool that would be, to speak to someone the 700 Club. I wish it had been more spiritual. But anyway, I went up there, and he started just asking me a few questions. And I just told him, man, we're praying. I'm just seeking God's direction for my life. And, and, and it was just a neat little few minutes. In fact, it wasn't even minutes, probably, more like a few seconds. Uh, but, but you just never know. But you start serving God and doing the things of God. You don't wait for the perfect time. You don't wait until you feel like it. God, show me, I want to see these masterpieces like you see them. Have you ever seen something in somebody that they didn't see in themselves? 
I've had some kids in my youth group. I had a kid, man, rowdy, rowdy. I mean, troublemaker and, and everything. And I looked at him one day. I said, nah, man. I said, some days God's going to get a hold of your life. And he's just rebellious. He's just rebellious. His dad didn't know what to do with him, you know. Um, he, he lived with his dad. They had divorced. And, and, um, but I told him every chance I got, I believe in you, Dave Domina. God's going to take care of you and get you a hold of your life one day. I don't know if I even believe in this God stuff. <laughs> Today he's a worship leader in a very large church down in Florida. But I saw him years ago. In fact, he texted me one time or did something. I don't remember. Years ago, Pastor Key, you are the only one who ever believed in me. My dad didn't think I would turn out good either. But you said you always knew and you always believed. He said, I can't thank you enough that you took the time to speak into my life. And it's amazing. But I saw it in him. He didn't see it. Nobody around me saw it, I guess. But see, that's something God can do with all of us. We can see something in somebody that maybe they can't even see in themselves. Have you ever said, oh, he's okay? No, he's not okay. I even had a pastor one time. I said, but he's a good boy. He goes, no, good boys don't do this and this and this. I said, okay. He did bad things, but he's still a good boy. I said, and in fact, it was a kid. And, and I said, I still believe. And guys, I do often wonder, what if he had nobody to thank him for? Would he have one day maybe still come back? I don't know. But I believe you and I speak into people's lives, and, 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 and we believe in them. Even though they're struggling and they're having hard times, we love them. So if we're going to find unity, if we're going to find and be one as a community, it's important to recognize ourselves and others as the masterpieces God has created us all to be. That's who we are. And once again, am I making this stuff up? No. It's the Word of God. It's God's Word. And folks, God's Word never returns void. It's the truth. As you honor God's Word, God honors you. You walk in His favor. Isn't that how it works? When you do the things of God that He's commanded us and encouraged us to do, and we've learned to walk in His favor. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. Well, hey, I want to, uh, before I close in prayer, I do want to invite everybody to be with us on Sunday morning. Uh, five smooth stones. Uh, Ralph, you and Kenneth, on Sunday, I'm going to give you a rock. I want you to, <laughs> I want you to keep this rock, okay? Okay, I've already speaks two, so some have two rocks. But you guys can catch up, and we'll give you three rocks if you want. But we're talking about five smooth stones about David and Goliath. First sermon is all about Goliath. The next was all about David. Now we're going to start getting into some interesting stuff on the battle, man, of what all the things that happen. It's pretty powerful. But the rocks that I'm giving you, I want you to put in coat pockets. Put them someplace where you can see them. And every time you look or every time you put your hand in your pocket, you remember who you are. You know, you're a warrior. And you, you, God gives you the ability to just to defeat, defeat the giants in your lives. He promised. So I want to invite you all to be sure and be with us in that service. And also, actually a week from today, I'm going to be going on a prayer quest. And many of you received letters um, that were sent out to ask you to send me uh, your prayer requests, some things that I can pray with you about. And, and everything's confidential. Actually, I destroy them afterwards. Nobody can see them. Because uh, sometimes it's pretty personal things. But you know what? I'm going to go to God. I'm going to, I'm going to seek God for answers. And I'm going to believe God to answer those prayers. And if some of you out there have not received a letter like that, you need to call the church and we'll make sure. Or text me. Or get on Facebook and say, hey, Grace Fellowship. Um, I don't know. I'm not really techie that way. But somehow, if you'd like uh, one of the letters to really explain what's going on, I'd love for you to have one. And I would love to take your prayer request with me. Um, I'm taking three or four days and just going off by myself. And, and guys, I'm just seeking the Lord. I really believe God ministers through this. So, so keep that in mind, too. We'd love to have you be able to get your request in as well. Well, bow your heads with me, if you would, as we dismiss tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. This was a privilege, God, to stand before your people. 
It's a privilege, God, to be able to speak your word, even out to our Facebook family, God. I pray that you bless each and every one and let each one know what a masterpiece they are created by you, God, in your image. And may we recognize everyone as a masterpiece and may we reflect you, Jesus. May they see you in our lives as we walk this everyday world till the day we come to be with you. And God, you know we have many sick. We're still trusting you, God, to reach out and to heal our sick. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We hope to see you on Sunday.